God will ask Abraham to do what seems unbearable and unreasonable. And by faith, expect what seems impossible. Oh, how the Bible haters love to take this passage and make God out to be a terrible ogre. Go to a certain hilltop in the region of Moriah, a very specific mountain, and in that high place, kill Isaac, your son of promise. Abraham could easily have said at this point, enough God, I'm done with following your way. I won't do it. Abraham doesn't hesitate. He rises early the next morning and sets off to immediately obey God. So Abraham knows either God will intervene to stop the sacrifice, or God would have to raise his only son from the dead. These events were foreshadowing a greater future event, and the prophetic symbolism acted out would have been ruined by the inclusion of the donkey and servants. The calling of God in Abraham's life required him to make four painful sacrifices. He had to abandon his homeland, leave his father's house, send his firstborn son from his house. And in this chapter, we'll see the fourth great sacrifice commanded by God in the life of Abraham. Each sacrifice was traumatic for Abraham, but the blessings of God increased in Abraham's life as he gradually grew into a life of obedience. But this last sacrifice would endanger the future of Abraham's heritage. God will ask Abraham to do what seems unbearable and unreasonable, and by faith, expect what seems impossible. Open your Bibles to Genesis 22, the binding of Isaac, reading from verse 1 from the New King James. Now it came to pass after these things, after the birth of Isaac and after Abraham's covenant with Abimelech, we jump forward in time some undisclosed period. Rabbinic tradition suggests more than three decades have passed. Isaac is now no longer a baby or a child, but a strong, fully grown man. And it was at this duly appointed time that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Let me tell you a little secret. I've never heard the audible voice of God like Abraham did on numerous occasions. I've heard many people claim they heard from the voice of God directly. I doubt most Christians who make such claims. Even in the Bible, God rarely spoke audibly to some of the great saints. It's just not how God normally operates. As history unfolded and more of the written word of God was available to the people of faith, God spoke audibly less frequently. People are forever wanting a shortcut, a personal hack to make life easier, to cheat their way to spiritual maturity and truth. Well, God has given us his word. You want to hear from God? You can hear from him every day when you read the Bible. You'll grow closer to God as you spend years and decades buried in his word, learning to live his word daily. Let me reveal another spiritual secret. All the shortcuts to spiritual maturity are dead ends, leading you up the garden path. Abraham, who had no Bible as such to instruct him, perhaps he had some writings from people like Noah, that would later be used by Moses to assist in shaping scripture. But Abraham, having no formal scripture, receives direct heavenly revelation. And his reply to God shows his openness to be led of God. Here I am. What do you want me to do, God? Where do you want me to go? I'm ready to receive your instructions. God has a personal call to each of his children. I'm not suggesting you're going to hear audibly from God. But God has given each of us gifts and abilities, desires and drives. And he's given us all 66 books of his word. He expects us to take those good things and begin employing them in service for Jesus. If he's given you skillful hands, here I am, Lord. Use them to make something for Jesus. If he's given you a quick tongue, here I am, Lord. Use me to boldly declare the gospel of Christ. If he's given you functioning feet and legs, use them to walk in his will. 
if he's given you a clear thinking mind. Set that mind to thinking of ways to bring glory to the king. If he's given you ambition, here I am, Lord. Set that ambition to the task of sounding out far and wide the greatness of God. If he's given you money, use that money generously and compassionately to the purpose of the expansion of his kingdom. Maybe you only have poverty and unemployment, you might protest. Here I am, Lord. Use my spare time to assist in discipling the young saints of God. God is calling out to you through his word. Are you listening? Are you available? Are you willing, as Abraham was? Verse 2. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering, on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Oh, how the Bible haters love to take this passage and make God out to be a terrible ogre. They like to imagine the PTS that both Abraham and Isaac endured after this horrific ordeal. But God knows Abraham better than anyone. He knows every atom in Isaac's body. God has purposes far beyond what hateful Bible critics could even conceive of. Whenever there's some passage greatly misapplied and misunderstood by enemies of the Bible, wherever you come across what, at first glance, seems like a contradiction, whenever there's something apparently contrary to God's declared and immutable character, you have a heavenly mystery. The only ones who will discover the deep truth buried within and beneath the mystery are those willing to dig, those genuinely open to the teaching of the Holy Spirit and those with the motivation to invest the required time needed to investigate and uncover. If you come at the Bible with hostile intent and hatred, you'll likely walk away as ignorant of the truth as when you first arrived. Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Wait a minute, God. Abraham has two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. No. God is declaring you only have one son of promise, one son of faith, one son of freedom, one son born from a God-sanctioned union. Ishmael came from an unsanctioned carnality, the child of enslavement, the child of faithlessness, a child from adultery. God's declaring, in no uncertain terms, everything you did with Hagar was wrong. Marriage is between one man and one woman, to the exclusion of all other unions. Polygamy is wrong. Adultery is wrong. Casual sleeping around is wrong. Men with men is wrong. Women with women is wrong. Take Isaac, your one and only son of promise, your son of love, your son of laughter. And God tells Abraham to do the unthinkable. Go to a certain hilltop in the region of Moriah, a very specific mountain, and in that high place, kill Isaac, your son of promise, this son who you've waited for decades to arrive, now you must terminate his life. This is a stunning command from God, unthinkable. Can this be the will of God? Can this really be the voice of God? For some people, the will of God for their life is too tough a path to follow, and they turn away from God before he reveals the greater good down the track, the blessings that will follow hardship. God, you can't expect me to give up my comfortable life and comfortable job and comfortable home and serve you. Abraham could easily have said at this point, Enough, God, I'm done with following your way. This is too great a demand. This is not fair. This isn't right. I won't do it. Verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. And this is why God picked Abraham to be his chosen man of promise. Yes, Abraham was a sinner. He was a faulty man, just like you and me. He could act in carnal ways, just like you and me. He definitely acted selfishly on numerous occasions 
just like you and me. Often his actions showed tremendous faithlessness, just like we can show. But now he was a man well beyond a hundred years of age. He'd seen the workings of God in his life. He'd experienced the power of God. He'd received the promises of God. He'd talked face to face with God. And through all these experiences, Abraham was finally the man that God could see that no one else could see. God sees what we can't. He looked at a zealous Christ-hating Pharisee and saw a great evangelist for Jesus. He looked at a wicked tax collector named Zacchaeus and saw a future saint of Christ. He looked at a pagan Canaanite prostitute named Rahab and saw a woman to be included in the family of Israel and the line of Messiah. He looked at a lowly farm boy and saw the future king of Israel, a man after God's own heart. He saw an idol-worshipping pagan living in the city of Ur and saw the future man of faith that would obey God no matter the cost. Abraham doesn't hesitate. He arises early the next morning and sets off to immediately obey God. Notice, <laughs> he doesn't repeat these God-given instructions to Sarah. There's no chance Sarah would have approved of his obedience to God in this matter. God has already told Abraham that Isaac was the son of promise. So Abraham knows either God will intervene to stop the sacrifice or God would have to raise his only son from the dead. Abraham displays enough faith to realise God has power over life and death. As followers of Christ, we express this same faith. We know God has power over the grave. We know the Son of God conquered the grave and has promised his disciples one day he's going to return, blow the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The cemeteries will release the redeemed. The dust will deliver the dead. The oceans will discharge the saints. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the raised dead into the cloud to be with the Lord forever. In a twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. Corruption will become incorruptible. Mortal will become immortal. Death defeated, sin removed, sorrow removed, pain removed, suffering removed, carnality removed. The hope of eternal life realised for us. This was the hope that Abraham clung to in faithful obedience. Verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Abraham arrived at this very specific place, specifically chosen by God in the hill country of Moriah, meaning the land of Yahweh. Abraham couldn't go to any hilltop. There was one particular Yahweh chosen location for this sacrifice to take place. A holy hill, a mount of mourning, a chosen, cherished place. Moriah is the mountain ridge along which the city of Salem, later to be renamed Jerusalem, was built upon. This was a sacred hilltop location, just outside the city of peace, from which ruled the king of righteousness, the mysterious Melchizedek, priest of El Elyon. Abraham lifted up his eyes, focused on God's destination for his mission, single-minded in purpose, set to his task of obedience regardless of the cost, dedicated to living out the will of El Elyon. God's chosen man, in God's particular location, at God's duly appointed time. Verse 5. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. This was a mission for the father and son alone. The two servants are instructed to remain at the lower ground. Abraham and Isaac will ascend alone to the holy, chosen, special place of elevated worship. Abraham emphatically declares, We will come back to you. We will return together. Even though God had instructed Abraham to sacrifice his son, Abram's faith shines dynamically in his words. We will come back to you. Not we might, we will. Not I will. We will come back to you. He knew God must deliver his son of promise, 
either spare his son from death or raise him back to life. At this point in his walk with the Lord, Abraham has matured into a great man of faith. God has transformed him over the decades into the man God needed him to be. Just as God can work with deficiencies and failings in our lives, over time, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he can mould us and shape us into the men and women he needs us to become. Now let's deal with this descriptive word Abraham uses for his son, the lad and I. The Hebrew word na'er, here translated as lad, is used well over 200 times in the Bible. It can mean anything from a toddler to a young man. It would seem the word is apparently well translated into English as lad. It wouldn't be out of place for a 90-year-old man today to speak about a 30-year-old as a lad. It's all about perspective. Abraham, at this point in the narrative, is likely somewhere close to 130 years of age. Anyone younger than 50, from his perspective, would be considered a lad to him. Later in the Genesis narrative, an apparently grown Benjamin, as old as mid-thirties, is repeatedly called a lad. Joshua, a fully grown young man, was also referred to using this same term. The spies Joshua sent into Canaan were described using this same Hebrew term, na'er. So forget about Isaac being a little boy. It's far more likely, from hints in the text, Isaac was a fully grown man. Verse 6, so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. A very significant and heavy pile of wood is needed to complete a burnt offering. This is the clearest indication in the text that Isaac isn't a child or a young boy. We're not talking about just an armful of wood. This would have been a very hefty pile of wood strapped to his back, which is indicated in the narrative. Abraham loads Isaac up. He laid the wood on Isaac, likely between 50 and 100 kilograms of wood, and it needed to be lugged to the top of the hill. A fit and strong Isaac in his 20s or 30s is certainly indicated by the carrying of the heavy burden of wood. Josephus, a first century Jewish historian, recorded that Isaac was 25 years of age. Abraham, being in his 120s or 130s, understandably left the heavy lifting to his adult son. Abraham simply takes a knife and a brand of fire. Having the two servants and donkey assist in carrying the wood up the hill would have been useful. But there are at least two obvious reasons the servants and the donkey are excluded from the task. Firstly, the servants would likely have intervened and restrained Abraham from proceeding with the sacrifice. Abraham was committed to obeying God and anxious to see how God would turn this situation for good. And secondly, these events were foreshadowing a greater future event and the prophetic symbolism acted out would have been ruined by the inclusion of the donkey and servants. And in our next study, we'll delve into those symbolic prophetic foreshadowings. Until then, may the God of Abraham and Isaac richly bless you all.